Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I've based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that with all my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find somewhere to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. I hope that intro that you just listened to stirs you up and encourages you and fires you up to continue on for the cause of Christ. You know, the name Sandy Creek Stirrings has some meaning behind it. If you don't know the reason behind the name of the podcast, Sandy Creek Stirrings, let me encourage you to go to our website. That would be sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, that's sandycreekstirrings.com. Click the About page, and we go into in-depth on to why we name the podcast Sandy Creek Stirrings. Now, I'm doing a little bit better as announced this past episode on Friday. I had a little bit of a cold and still not able to do a complete podcast recording, but I wanted to do a little something here for you. And uh, this is a message that I preached just a few months ago in our church uh, during our missions conference. I talked about biblical giving, and um, we covered giving a little bit back in our financial series that we covered here on the podcast. Um, This is a several episodes, many episodes ago now. and uh, But this episode really goes into missions giving as well, which is something we haven't covered too much here on the podcast. And so I want you to listen to this episode, Biblical Giving, Tithing Missions, and More, and see why we should give to missions, why we should tithe based on the Bible. And so let me encourage you to give this episode a listen, and uh, looking forward to recording some full-length episodes here um, on this next episode coming up on Friday. And so excited to get back to that. Until then, though, I hope you enjoy today's episode. I hope you enjoyed last uh, Friday's episode, Magic Words, by Dr. Lee Robertson. If you didn't hear that message, let me encourage you to go back and listen to that. But until next time, my friend, hey, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ. If you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 is where we're going to be at tonight, and I uh, I thank you for being here. And uh, how many of you knew that you can now cheat and know what we're going to preach on before the service? If you go, because we go live five minutes before the service starts, you can go on there, and if you don't like what we're going to preach about, you can leave. And uh, so, no, no, you don't want to do that. And uh, But I didn't know if you knew that or not, and so, but uh, there we go. And and, uh, but anyway, um, so we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tonight. And what a high price Jesus Christ did pay. Right. You know, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we began a new series in the teen Sunday school class with the teenagers going over just some very basic doctrines of the faith and talked about salvation and talked about what my Christ, what Jesus, what he suffered for me. And sometimes I think we, we just, well, Jesus, Jesus loved me, this I know. But I think sometimes we forget how much he really did pay, how much he really did sacrifice for us. I mean, this was the Jesus who not only was he born and not only did he take the cross, but you have to remember an intrinsic part of that story is what he left behind. Because he left a place where there was no tears, there was no pain, there was none of that. There wasn't any of that. He left a place called heaven. He left that that throne of glory to come down and be born. That's the first sacrifice he made. And then to be born in a stable. I mean, hey, I'm not God, but if I was God, I wouldn't want to be born in a stable. I mean, come on, give me a give me a, a throne or something to be born on. Give me a, a crib of gold. You know, I'm just a prideful human being. 
But God would be born in a stable, and then he'd live a perfect life, and he'd have to go out with his father, and he'd have to learn how to be a carpenter, and he'd have to go through the, all these different things. And then he'd, be, he'd go without, have you thought about how he went, out, went without food for 40 days? I don't know about how long you fasted before, but 40 days is a long time. I don't know how he did it. It's incredible. But he went without food for 40 days. Why? Because the Bible says that um, we're, we're not so special that he wasn't touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows what it's like to go through the temptations and the trials. And he went through a temptation from Satan himself. You know, most of the time, Satan himself doesn't deal with you and I. We're not that important most of the time. He'll send somebody else, send a demon that way. But Satan came to Christ himself. Why did Christ do it? Because Christ loved you and I. And then he went all the way to the cross and all those things we could talk about, how he was beaten with whips and how they took the crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they bashed it into his skull. And you know, sometimes we think of my wife has a knockout rose bush. It's got tiny little prickles on it, tiny little prickles and tiny little briars. And you'll go up the stairs and it'll catch on your pant leg and it doesn't feel too good. But that's not the type of thorns that he had. He had thorns that were long and they would have penetrated the skull. I mean, just terrible things that he would have endured. He was slapped, he was spit on, and then had to carry that cross with his bloodied back, took the, took the stripes from the scourging. And by the way, the Bible, the way that he would have been scourged with that cat of nine tails would have literally ripped the, the flesh wide open. He, his stomach would have been dragging on the floor as he went up to Calvary. Yeah. But he did it because he loved you and I. Right. And that's what Christ was willing to sacrifice for you. And then to be have his hands nailed. By the way, how incredible to think that my Lord would love me so much. They didn't have to, like all the other guys, they didn't have to hold them down to get them on the cross. He laid down willingly, outstretched his arms. He said, I love them this much. And Christ was willing to sacrifice himself for you and I. That's how much my Christ loved you, so high a price he paid. But aren't you thankful that the Bible says that he was strong enough to lay down his life but he was strong enough to take it up again. Everything that we're doing here tonight hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was talking with the uh, teenagers this morning. I said, you know why we don't serve Muhammad? You know why I don't have to worry about if Joseph Smith was right? And I don't have to worry about why I'm not a Buddhist. You know why? Because I can go to their graves and I can dig up their bones. But I can go to Israel right now where there's an empty tomb and an empty grave where God said, I have power to give my life, but I have power to take it up again. The death has no sting, grave has no victory. That's the price he was willing to pay for you and I. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tonight, but I think it'd be appropriate that we first start off the message by praying and thanking our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for his great and amazing sacrifice he'd be willing to pay. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for this time together we have tonight. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have to sit here in this church, in this place in High Springs, Florida, and Lord, I pray that we would worship your name and that we'd glorify you. Lord, that's the whole purpose we were created. Lord, we, we, are, we were created to honor and to glorify you. And Lord, I pray in this service tonight that we would indeed accomplish that purpose for which you created us. And Lord, then tonight, I pray that you'd touch our hearts. I pray that you'd speak to us. I pray that each and every single person here, including myself, would learn something from the message tonight and be touched by you and your hand and your word. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, if you had cheated before the service, you may not have stayed. No, I'm just kidding. But a great a great topic we're going to talk about tonight, one that everybody's going to be excited to talk about. We're going to talk about biblical giving. Biblical giving in the just the wind goes out of the room. And, uh, you know, everybody's waiting for that eventual time where we're in a church and we're going to talk about giving, why you should give, how you should give. And so, but we're going to talk about that tonight. You see, giving is an important part of the Bible. Giving is an important part of the Bible. You find the word give 813 times in scripture, 813 times. You find giveth 119 times. You find gave 426 times, giving 29 times, given four. 480 times giving is an essential part of scripture and giving is an essential part of life just in general. When Abraham Lincoln became president, he, he was appointed to that office and everybody began coming to him seeking to be put in some sort of public office for recognition. And just everybody from all over just flogging him with people and crowds, just seeking something that they would give him a position. Finally, he was sick with typhoid fever, laid up in the bed, and he called his secretary and he said, tell the office seekers to come on. I have something I can give to everybody now. <laughs> and um, 
There was a missionary, speaking of September's Missions Month, there was a missionary who was preaching in a church talking about the need overseas for missionaries. And they needed more funds. And the pastor got up. He said, we're going to take an offering for the missionaries overseas. Well, they got the offering plates. The ushers went down the aisle. And they're sitting on this side. Was it not, not particularly this side, this side. And it, it's, you never know. You could hurt feelings. And uh, But sitting down there, there was a man. He just had his arms folded. He had a scowl on his face. He was just upset. He didn't want to be there. And the usher came by and the usher stood there in front of him and the guy just shook his head. He said, no. And so the usher just kind of poked him with it. You know, what a good usher. He just kind of poked him with the offering plate and uh, the guy said, uh-uh. He said, and the, the usher leaned down and he said, sir, he said, it, it's for missionaries overseas. And the man folded his arms. He said, I don't believe in them. So the usher was a sharp man. He looked down and he said, well, why don't you take some out? It's for the heathen anyway. And uh, that wouldn't fly so well in a church with an offering plate. But you know, giving is important. It's important that we take time. You say, why? Because of something we just talked about, God was the first to give. Before you and I were ever a blip on the radar of humanity, Christ and God had already determined that he would have to give himself for us. You realize Christ, before he created the world, before that, before that even came into existence, he had to make the decision, if I create the world, I will create man. If I create man, they will sin. If they sin, I will have to give myself to die for them. And then he said, let there be light because he wanted to do it anyway. He wanted to give himself for you and I. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave his only begotten Son. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The Bible says in Galatians chapter number 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How incredible that God in his foreknowledge would give himself for me. So when we go to talk about giving tonight, I want it to be very clear that God's love produced his gift. God's love produced his gift. God so loved the world that he gave. The evidence that he loved was in the fact that he gave. Love always produces giving. If you love your wife, when Christmas time comes around, I guarantee you, you're going to want to try and give her something. If you love your children, their birthdays come around, you love them, you're probably going to try to give them something. Why? Because love produces giving. And here's the deal. We may be preaching on giving tonight, but it's a good topic to talk about in church. Amen? Amen. All right. Maybe we'll make it through. And it's a good topic to talk about in church because there are some people, I'll just be honest with you, there are some churches who you'd preach on giving and people would be upset and say, well, they're talking about giving again. Don't they think we give enough? It's not a matter of that. The Bible says to preach the entire counsel of the Word of God. That's right. That includes giving. Amen. But you know what? I, I promise you this. Someone who has a problem with a message on giving they typically don't have a money problem. They have a love problem. They have a love problem. And so we're going to talk about giving tonight. You're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, moreover, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now stop right there. Paul is, of course, writing to the Corinthian church, and he's going to write to them, and he's going to give them an example of something. You remember being in school, and your math teacher would put a math, they would call it a problem, it was a math example on the board to teach you how to work it out. And maybe your English teacher would go up here and she'd give you an example of a preposition. I still don't know what a preposition is. And, uh, but they'd give you an example. Why? So you could figure out and you could identify what is the preposition in the sentence. Paul is doing the same thing. He's giving an example to the Corinthian church on an example of something they should be doing. God is writing through Paul, not just to the Corinthian church, but to you and I as well, an example of something we should be doing. What is the example? He brings up the churches of Macedonia. Look there in verse number two, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the, say that word with me, yeah 
give. Do y'all, all of y'all have your Bibles open tonight? Right there. Look at, look at verse number four. What's that word? Receive the what? The yeah. gift. Receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Take upon, they, they wanted, the, the churches of Macedonia wanted Paul to receive the what? The gift. Now, if this was junior church tonight, I would tell the kids, you know what? I want you to say it so loud that it's the walls of Jericho and this wall comes crashing down. You don't know how many times that I've told them to get the walls to crash down on y'all in the service, but that's why it's so loud back there. But they, to receive the what? Receive the yeah. gift. Very good. That was a little better. And they wanted to receive Paul to receive this gift. Paul is bringing to mind to the example of the churches of Macedonia. He's bringing this example of their giving. That's what this example is all about. He's bringing this example of their giving. Notice that word riches of liberality. See that in verse, I think it's verse number three, riches of their liberality, maybe verse two. That word liberality literally means the generosity. Notice the churches of Macedonia, they were givers. They sent a gift to the apostle Paul out of the riches of their liber, uh, liberality, of the riches of their generosity. Notice what it says though, were they rich people? Look there in verse number two. It says, how then in a great trial of affliction. So they're going through a lot of different trials right now. The abundance of their joy and they're notice their deep poverty. Their deep poverty. Notice these people are givers. Paul is giving an example to the church of Corinth and to you and I, an example of givers who were poor. They were in poverty. Now I would venture to say that pretty much every one of us tonight are not necessarily in the poverty Paul is talking about. You might live below the U.S. poverty level, go to a third world country. To them, that's, you are rich. You are rich. This is not the type of poverty Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about they have nothing. They are in deep poverty. He didn't just say poverty. He said deep poverty, but he brought forth the example of their giving, of their giving. Now, we're going to talk about two types of giving tonight, and then we'll be finished up, but two types of giving, the type of giving that the church of Macedonia gave. Look in verse number three, and you'll see it. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. There's two parts of biblical giving, and we'll cover them tonight. Number one, I want you to notice there was the giving to their power. The giving to their power, or tonight, the giving to your power. Here's the deal. God wants you to be a giver That's right. in all aspects of life, and not just financially. Sometimes you need to give of your time. Sometimes you need to give of your talent. Sometimes you need to give of whatever it may be. God wants you to give. Sometimes it is finances, but God wants you to be a giver. And when we are blessed... That's when we need to learn that great piece of wisdom in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, where it says it is more blessed to give than to, than to receive. Excuse me. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So what is that portion of giving that you and I can give? It's within our power to do so. It's the very foundation. It's the very basis of biblical giving, and that would be the tithe. That would be the tithe is the very basis, the very foundation of biblical giving. That's something we are capable of doing. The Bible says, and the the very word tithe literally means tenth. It means a tenth percent. And so what a tithe is, is it's a tenth percent of your income is supposed to go to the work of God. That's what a tithe is. It's what a tithe is. And so God wants us to give to um, within your power what you're capable of doing. And you say... Brother Josh, I took a look at my budget. I don't think I'm capable of giving 10%. I don't think I'm capable of doing that. How, how's that going to work out? Let me tell you this. If God commanded you to do it, then you're capable of doing it. Turn to Malachi chapter 3 with me. Malachi chapter number 3. And uh, Malachi chapter 3, most of you know this, this verse pretty much already. But Malachi chapter 3, I want you to look at verse number 10. Malachi chapter 3. And verse number 10. Notice what God says. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10, last book of the Old Testament. He says, Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Notice what God says. He says, Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse. He doesn't say, If you want to. 
It doesn't say if you're able to. Notice it's a command from God. Bring ye. It's a command. Bring ye all the tithes of my storehouse. You say, Brother Josh, I just don't think I can. Am I, it's not working out on paper. This 10%, I just can't fit it in. And here's what God would say to you. What, same thing he said in that verse. He said, prove me. He said, try me. He said, go ahead and give it a shot. I dare you to give 10% this month to God and see what God can do. Because the Bible gives you a promise. He says, and I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So what is a tithe? That's a tenth of your income. A tenth of your income. So how do you tithe? Here's what you do. Let me give it to you real plain. When you get your paycheck in, however you get paid, when you get your paycheck in for the month, you're going to look down on your pay stub and you're going to find your gross income for that pay period. And you say, what do you mean gross income? Well, the IRS thinks it's so gross and so nasty that you made that much money that they've got to take some from you. And you throw out the net and you get the leftovers. That's the way I look at it. And uh, But the gross income is what you make before taxes. Your net is what's left over after you pay taxes. You tithe off the gross income. You say, why? Jesus Christ set a very clear example when he said, render unto Caesars the things that are Caesars. He said, hey, you need to be a taxpayer. may not like it, but hey, you need to be a taxpayer. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. That would be the tithe. You're supposed to pay your taxes. You're supposed to pay your tithe. What do you tax off of? You, how, do you think you like, how do you think the IRS would like it if you, ta if you got taxed off your net income? They wouldn't like that. Here's what I have left over at the end of the month. I have $2. Why don't you tax me on that? That's not the way it works. They tax you on your gross income. Then why would we shortchange God and, tax and, and tithe off of our net income? We tithe off our gross income. You say, where do I bring my in? Where do I bring my tithe to? Look there in uh, Malachi chapter three, verse ten. Bring ye all the tithes into the what? Into the storehouse. You'll find that this storehouse, this place that God is referring to, is the place where the people of God assembled for worship. Also, where the servants of God were. You'll find in the Old Testament that was the tabernacle in the first half of the Old Testament. Second half of the Old Testament, you'll find it to be the temple. That's where they brought their tithes. You'll find within the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where did they bring their tithes? They brought it to the church house. They brought it to their local independent church that they were a member of. That's where they took their tithes to. So you need to be a tither. It's commanded by God. That's the first part of giving. It is to your power. You say, I don't think I'm able. God says, prove me. Try me. Give me a shot. Let's see if we can make this work. That's to your power, what you're capable of. Now, I don't know in this room who is tithers and who doesn't tithe, but maybe you're considering, maybe you're pondering tithing. And you say, I don't know. I'm just not sure, Brother Josh. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to pray about this. Typically, what you're going to do is you're going to go home and you're going to start praying about it. And you're going to talk to your, your coworkers. Say, so, you know, I heard a message on tithing. What do you think about that? And eventually, along the way, someone will come along because Satan works this way. He'll come along and somebody will say, you know, tithing isn't applicable to Christians anymore. You know, that's that's... Old Testament. You say something along the lines of tithing is part of the old Mosaic law, which Christ fulfilled. I want to tackle that question before we move any further. When somebody says tithing is part of the old Mosaic law, Christ fulfilled it. It's talking about the law that Christ, that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, gave to Moses, Mosaic, Mosaic, Moses, Mosaic, Mosaic law. God gave the law to Moses, all those commandments. And the Bible says in the New Testament that the law was a schoolmaster unto us. Have you ever had a schoolmaster who they always pointed out your problems? They're supposed to. They take a red pen and they, they point out all your problems. They're constantly poking you, saying, here, here. That's what the law was. It was constantly poking us and prodding us, saying you can never be perfect enough to go to heaven. You can never be perfect enough to go to heaven. Here's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. It was a schoolmaster to us. And then the Bible goes on to say, but Christ fulfilled the law. And that's what they're referring to. But it's very important that we understand there were three different, now hang with me, there were three different types of laws within the Mosaic law. The first part was the moral laws. Say that with me, the moral laws, issues of morality. When the Bible said, thou shalt not kill, it's bad. It's never going to be Good. All right. Thou shalt not murder anybody is it what it's exactly referencing. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shouldn't lie. Those are issues of morality. They're always going to be right. They're always going to be wrong. They're never going to change. 
issues of morality. Then you had civil laws, civil laws. Civil laws had to deal with the government. You have to realize during this time, they didn't have a president. They didn't have a, a governor. They didn't have a democracy. They didn't have a republic. They didn't have any of that. They had God as their king. God was their king. Whatever God said, wherever God in the cloud or in that pillar of fire moved, that's where they went. God was their king. Well, how do you, how do you have a government like that? And so God gave them civil laws to say, here's what you do for this. Here's what you do for this. Here's what you do for this. There were civil laws. And then number three, there were ceremonial laws. Say that with me, ceremonial laws. Ceremonial laws were laws which the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, or first, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2, in verse number 17, the Bible says, which are a shadow of things to come. Our shadow of things to come. Let me ask you a question. If we were to look at ceremonial laws, we could look at sacrifices, couldn't we? Sacrifices were a ceremonial law. Let me ask you this. Do they still sacrifice today? Do they sacrifice animals? No, they don't. Interesting enough, Jews, even though they don't worship Jesus as the Messiah, they don't sacrifice since He came. Isn't that interesting? But they don't sacrifice anymore. Why? Because when an Israelite took a lamb and he went to the tabernacle and he sacrificed that lamb, he wasn't washing away his sins. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that the blood of bulls and sacrifices could never wash away the sins of the people. But here's what they were doing. By taking it, they're saying, God, I'm being obedient to you. And by, being obedient, by being obedient to you, I'm trusting that one day there will come a Messiah who will take away the sins of the world and be the ultimate sacrifice. He will be the Lamb of God. And that's why they knew when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God! They knew exactly this is the sacrifice that will take away the sins of the world. What was the sacrifices? They were a ceremonial law. So when somebody says, you know, tithing is a mosaic law, it's part of the old law, and Christ fulfilled it, well, which part did He fulfill? Did He fulfill all of it? Are you saying He took away all of it? So is it okay for me to murder people now? No, He didn't take away the moral laws. Here's what Christ did. He took away the ceremonial laws. Well... Is tithing a ceremonial law or is it a moral law? Look at Malachi chapter 3 where you're at. Look at verse number 8. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8, Will a man, notice that word, say it out loud with me, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. God says, Hey, you've robbed me. You've stolen from me. And we, just because we're the people we are, we say, we haven't robbed you. What are you talking about? We didn't rob you. And God says, no, you have in tithes and in offerings. Isn't there a commandment that's it's a moral law, thou shalt not steal? Is robbing and stealing the same thing? I think it is. What does that make tithing? If you don't, if you don't tithe, the Bible says you're stealing from God, which is an issue of morality. Meaning tithing is a moral law. You say, well, if tithing was a moral law, then people should have been doing it before the law. And you're right, they did. Genesis chapter 4, you have Abel gave a, of the firstlings of his flock. The firstlings were given as part of the tithe. You'll see that Abraham in Genesis 14, 20, the Bible says that he gave tithes. And Jacob gave tithes in Genesis chapter 28, way before the law. That's right. Way before the law. So tithing is something that is not just something that Christ fulfilled and did away with, it's still applicable today. But then another thing they'll bring up is they'll say, well, you know, tithing isn't applicable today because the New Testament doesn't talk about tithing. That's a lie. Matthew chapter 28, verse 28, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe. There it is, right there. It mentions tithing. But here's the, here's the deal. The New Testament, Jesus Christ didn't come to do away with the law. Jesus Christ came and He built on the law. For instance, the Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In the Old Testament law, Thou shalt not commit adultery. An outward sin. Jesus Christ took it so much further. When He looked at them and He said, If thou lustest after someone in your heart, you've committed adultery with them already. That is taking it to a whole new level. Christ built on the law. Here's what He was saying to the Pharisees. They say Jesus didn't talk about tithes in the New Testament. Notice what Jesus said, Matthew 23, 23. I'll read it to you. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe. And then he says this, and have, om have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. 
He says, hey, you've been tithing, but you've forgotten some very important things. You've forgotten judgment. You've forgotten mercy. You've forgotten faith. And then he finishes the verse with this. He says, these things ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. He said, hey, you need judgment. You need mercy. You need faith. Don't quit tithing, but you need to add those to it. Christ was building on the tithe. Christ was building all the tithe. Is the tithe still applicable? Absolutely. We're so, still supposed to be tithers biblically. So let me just encourage you this. If you're on the fence and about tithing, you're like, I don't know. Should I tithe? Should I let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, bring ye the tithes into the storehouse, a direct command from God. And I'm trying to be as gentle and nice in a, in a financial subject, but let me just tell you this. If you don't tithe, you're not right with God. Because if we disobey anything in God's word, we're not right with Him. That's right, that's right. And so you say, well, what does my tithing do? I want to know my money goes to something good. What does my tithing do? Let me give you a few things that your tithing does. Number one, your tithing pays your pastor. Amen. That's the first thing that your tithe goes to is it pays your pastor. If our church was ever so, uh, we didn't have enough money and we had to decide between the light bill and the pastor the right decision for us to make would be to pay the pastor. The Bible says he's worthy of his reward. In fact, it says he's worthy of double honor. He did not pay me to say that, all right? But that would be the right decision to pay him. But we have a, a great, wonderful man of God. He would cut his check and he'd say, no, let's keep the lights on. That's the type of man he got. He is. Praise the Lord for that. We can't help what he's going to do after, after whatever he does when we pay him. But that's the first responsibility. Second thing that your tithing does is it keeps the lights on. It keeps the power going. Brother Nelson, go over there to the light switch. Here's what would happen if you stopped tithing. Our lights would go out and the power... on. But we would not have any power. We would not have any lights if you weren't a tither. No AC. This, the tithes go to pay the lease on this building, $2,200 a month. We could be meeting outside right now. It's hotter outside than it is in here. Maybe. And, uh, but you know, it, it goes to pay the lease. It pays the gas for the bus ministry. You know why I was able to get in the van this morning and go pick up kids because there was gas in the vehicle. You know where the gas came from? Your tithe. If you're a tither, you help to pay for some of that gasoline that went and picked up those kids on the bus route. Your tithe helped in that way. Your tithe uh, prints the bulletins. I don't know if you know, but we just don't order these. They just don't come in. We have to print them, and we have to pay for the ink for them to be printed. Well, that costs money. Where does that come from? It comes from your tithe. It comes from your tithe. Tithing pays for uh, some of the teen activities. Tithing pays for benevolence. If we give a, uh, a certain amount of money, we vote. We say, hey, let's help brother so-and-so. Uh, brother Kenny White was helped a, a, a month or so ago with the, the COVID you're going through and weren't able to work and things of that sort. And we said, hey, let's give him $500. Where did that come from? Your tithe. That's where it came from. You had a part in that. It goes into buying a van just like we did. Now, some of that money came from buses and things of that sort, but it, go, it came, uh, a large portion of it came from your tithes. I mean, we're talking about cleaning supplies, website running, the preachers that came in during August, their hotel rooms, their love offering, the airplane ticket, all that was paid for by you and your tithes. And so it uh, pays for tracks. Hey, you realize if somebody gets saved because of a track, you have a part in that because you are a tither. I don't know about you, but if I didn't tithe, I'd want to get in on that. Number two, I find biblical giving. Number two, you'll go back there to 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, and you'll see there in verse number 4, and we've got to hurry. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 4. First, he said the Macedonian churches gave to their power, but second, you find they gave, what's it say in there? It says they gave beyond their power. Paul said in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 3 of chapter 8, he said they gave to their record, yea, I bear record beyond their power. He records it down. He says, I want you to know they gave beyond their power. You say, what kind of giving is that? That's giving what you don't have or what you can't afford to give based on faith in God. Amen. It's giving above and beyond the tithe, which is biblically, biblically required. It's giving above and beyond that. And this is the giving that God will lay on your heart. Sometimes it's when a, a preacher is in a meeting and pastor says, hey, we're going to take up a love offering. And you just know inside your heart, God said, I need to give $100. You say, I can't really afford that right now. You know, that's kind of go for gas for work. But you know, I'm going to give it anyway. God told me to give it. He'll take care of it. That's called giving beyond your power. Truth is, you need that $100 to survive. You need that $100 to go to work, but you gave beyond your power. Faith, promise, missions, giving 
is giving beyond your power. That's, right, right. That's in its name. Did you hear the name? Faith, Promise, Missions, Giving. You say, what is that? Go backwards. It's missions giving. Or it's giving to missions, all right? Giving to missions based on your promise, what you promise to give every single month to the missions account, and it's based on faith. It's giving to missions, and you're promising, and it's based on faith. We don't call it budget promise missions giving, because that'd be missions giving where you'd go to your budget and you figure out, okay, how much can I afford, and this is what I'm going to write in. No, we're asking you to go to God and say, God, what would you have me to give by faith? When pastor says that next time, he says, your faith promise missions card, think about that word faith, because it's giving beyond your power. And you say, well, Brother Josh, I did. I started a book and, oh, I got it written down somewhere. Luke chapter 6, give and it shall be given unto you. God says, hey, I'm not going to let you starve. I'm not going to make it to where you can't get to work. I'm going to take care of you. Give and it shall be given unto you. So you cannot give God. And then number two, you got to remember, we're not asking you to just to pick some random number. You're not going to take some dice and throw them on the table and say, there it is, two fives. I'm supposed to give uh, $10 a month to the cause of missions. No, that's not what we're asking you to do. We're asking you to go and let God tell you. Yes. And if you follow what God tells you what to do, then my friend, you'll have nothing to worry about.